I'm the managing director of uh, sports medicine for the United States Olympic Committee. It's really been an amazing morning for me already to hear about how ultrasound is applied to just patients in general. Uh, I'm here to speak primarily about sports medicine and ultrasound. Although the presentations that I've heard, I think that uh, we need to remember that uh, they're a patient first and uh, all these different types of modalities are useful in their evaluation. I don't know if you've ever been to the Colorado Springs Olympic Training Center. Has ever, anybody ever visited us there? Awesome. Well, we hope that you all come back soon. So we recently came off a pretty large game in London, and I wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, what it is that we're doing and uh, how we might be able to reach out to you to help Team USA. So we're going to talk a little bit about the ultrasound utilization at our clinic. And what we did is uh, it was very interesting to hear about how we select modalities. At the USOC, our patient care is free. Uh, the clinicians are not motivated to perform procedures. We're simply motivated to help our patients. And so our utilization of uh, ultrasound over MR, uh, it's about MR to ultrasound is uh, one in five. We do basically 500% more ultrasound than MR imagery uh, for many of the reasons that you've already heard today. So what we did is we just simply observed and uh, we have uh, many different people that consult with us in our clinics, orthopedic physicians, uh, we have uh, PMR. Uh, one thing we don't have is an MSK ultrasound radiologist. Uh, we're, we're looking for that. Dr. Tony Buffard, maybe some of you know him, is a phenomenal person, but he only can do so much at one time. And uh, he's been a tremendous advocate for the implementation of ultrasound in our practices. So in-house, uh, we currently have a DRCR x-ray, musculoskeletal ultrasound, then on the outside, it's pretty much everything else that we might want to have. Uh, we're currently remodeling our clinic where we'll have an extremity MR, uh, an E9, and uh, IDEXA and similar types of things like that. It'll be interesting to see by having new modalities if that will influence our care that we do. I thought you might find this interesting, a uh, retrospective study of what it is that we're ordering on people. And so when we look at it, uh, we're almost uh, equal x-ray to MSK ultrasound. 95% of the patients that we see are MSK related complaints. We still have people that have illness, they get sick, they have respiratory infections and other types of things. But nevertheless, uh, we don't use CT very much at all. We use a lot of ultrasound and x-ray. And so when we went back and looked at it, you can see some of the numbers by commonality of the uh, clinic studies and then also the regions. Uh, we really like the uh, ultrasound on the shoulder. We like the dynamic ability to test it out. We're especially fond of using uh, ultrasound on ulnar collateral ligament injuries, uh, medial collateral ligament injuries. You know, it's pretty amazing modality. You can actually uh, assess whether it's proximal, distal, uh, interstitial, superficial, or deep on that uh, medial collateral ligament tear. And uh, if it is a grade two tear, that individual has a much better opportunity to return to sport with conservative management rather than invasive procedures. So by determining the clinical pathway right away, it means a lot to us because time is everything. And when I listen to uh, your discussions about emergency medicine and things like that, it does kind of set it in perspective for uh, It is a game. But nevertheless, if you've worked your entire life for one event, it's pretty important to make sure that you get a correct assessment from the get-go. We also use it a lot for the tendinopathies to be able to differentially assess right away whether we're looking at a tendonitis versus a tendinosis so that we can get on the correct care pathway on day one. So we find that we like it for much of the same reasons that we've already talked about, that it's non-invasive. Uh, we feel it's almost an extension of the physical examination, and we really enjoy the dynamic aspects of the study. It's also extremely cost-effective for us. So when we come back around one more time and take another look at uh, games-level sports medicine, you know, and we try and provide the edge. Statistically, the difference between somebody becoming a medalist and a competitor is 0.5%. So its success is measured in a part of a centimeter or a piece of a second. In fact, at the games, I'm sure you're aware, 
we had several uh, people that actually tied to the hundredth of a second. You know, that was somewhat controversial. Do you decide that by a coin flip or have them race again? But it's really important if you're going to provide the edge for an individual who's dedicated their life to one thing that you're able to get on the assessment right away. This is a different kind of edge. So in this, in this case right here, you can see this is a uh, short track speed skater. Uh, short track is a pretty interesting event. It's not something never, everybody knows about. They actually wear Kevlar underneath of their uh, skating uniforms. And the blades, it's kind of like uh, skating on Jinsu cutting knives or whatever those things are called, but they're about an 18 inch long skate. The skate uh, is about just over one millimeter in width. You can bend it sideways with your finger and obviously they're razor sharp. So if you're a short track skater and you fall down, you're not only interested in where your skates are, but also whoever's on the, with you. And in this particular case, this was uh, internally, we call it the second miracle on ice. Uh, this was a short track skater. I have permission to show his photo and use uh, his story as how we use ultrasound perhaps differently. He fell down and, uh, oh, well, I think it's pretty obvious what happened. You can see his skate, that was inside his thigh. So uh, he actually stabbed himself and the skate cut through the vastus medialis. It actually went all the way down to the femur and left a bone bruise on the femur. The laceration was just proximal to the uh, quadricep tendon and yeah, the blood you see coming down underneath his leg is actually from a severed uh, saphenous vein. And so uh, he has another picture that I, I don't show very often. It looks like a meat cleaver really was taken to the anterior aspect of his thigh. So he presented to the clinic in September uh, before the Winter Games in February for Vancouver. And uh, they called on the phone and said, well, Dr. Moe, is he going to be able to skate in Vancouver or not? And uh, you look at the guy. he was unable to activate his quadricep, couldn't move his knee, he was in a knee immobilizer, he was on crutches, and uh, he had skated 12 years to get to this position. It's a pretty big decision for him to make that call at that time. And so actually what happened is Dr. Buffard was in Spain and we were talking about telemedicine. And so uh, he powered up his laptop, logged in, and we did the exam together while he was uh, in Barcelona and we were in Colorado Springs, you know, move the probe an inch to distal. So we'd move it and wait, take about three or four seconds. He says, yeah, that looks good. And so we could see that fortunately he spared the tendon and was really primarily a myofascial laceration. And one thing that we did that perhaps is different is we did serial exam studies and we actually watched the histology of the tissue as it healed. And so instead of going off of a textbook at this week you do that, at this week you do this, um, J.R. Selsky is an amazing individual. They're superhuman and their ability to recover is phenomenal. And so we literally watched the tissue mend and we knew when it was connected back to the point where we could start isometric contractions and then we were able to carve a couple weeks off as rehab. And so by watching the dynamic ability of the muscle to contract and see its effect distally, we were able to advance his program. And you may or may not be aware, but Jaroselski did skate. And he won two bronze medals, and it's all on him, not on us. But he won two bronze medals in the Vancouver Games. And just as recently as last month, set a world record for the fastest uh, time in short track. Well, that's one application of musculoskeletal ultrasound. At the London Games, things are changing, doctors. There's no doubt about it. Musculoskeletal ultrasound is becoming much more commonly utilized. And so on the top here, you can see, uh, well, obviously, the tower bridge. But this is the uh, Poly Clinic. It was about a 5,000 square foot clinic. Our friends in the UK did a phenomenal job preparing for us. Uh, there was a GE uh, 3T scanner, a 1.5 scanner, thin slice CT. They had an E9 and uh, one other type of ultrasound modality available. This is my friend. His name's Phil O'Connor. He was the imaging lead. Some of you may know Phil. He's a phenomenal radiologist and with a real special interest in musculoskeletal ultrasound. So that showed our services available. You know, uh, the most busy places in the polyclinic, uh, the first one is dentistry and the second one is optometry. Uh, we forget, I think, sometimes that we're people of privilege 
and a lot of people, even if you're the most famous athlete from that country, you don't have access to dental care. And so when the athletes come into the polyclinic where the care is free, they get their teeth fixed and they get a pair of glasses. And they also get a 3T MR scan of their knee that's been bothering or whatever it is else that they had. Actually, uh, I know that a couple of cases of uh, cancer were identified in the abdomen on people that just simply didn't have the ability to be worked up to the level that they could be. So Dr. Phil O'Connor, a great guy. Here's what happened. So if you look at the studies that were performed, uh, not much CT, uh, quite a bit of X-ray 400, N is 400 on uh, about 1,700 patients. Ultrasound was 400 studies comprising about 32%. It's the light yellow component of the ring. Then on the bottom is the MR. That, they really ran the scanner. It, it was free. They ran it from morning till night. There was no doubt about it. But nevertheless, it was similar in the Paralympics. And so remember that it's not just the Olympics and able-bodied athletes, it's also the Paralymp Paralympians who are equally important to us. And with their complex histories, basically ultrasound statistics remain the same across both populations. What was scanned? Well, knees, spine, and then the shoulder, some ankles. It was pretty interesting. We actually took our own uh, ultrasound with us. The U.S. travels heavy with medicine. Uh, we, we bring probably, I don't know, 23 to 27 pallets uh, on a shipping container. And so we have our own ultrasound unit that we use in the clinic. It's used for some, uh, uh, some of our physicians might inject under the uh, utilization of the ultrasound, but we also use it for this diagnostic capabilities. So for us, and when we look at the barriers, really for us it's the access to you. It's the access to the experts. And also, as it's already been mentioned, the ability to get a great image will result in the ability to have a great interpretation. Pretty tough to interpret an image when you really don't have the proper studies, the complete studies, or a lack of the dynamic studies. So ultrasound is really a big deal uh, in sports medicine. And in elite sports medicine clinics, I think it's very interesting when the barrier of finances and the incentivization of fee for service versus what is our patient need is removed, ultrasound goes way up and MR goes way down. And so I think that that's just really an interesting perspective and I especially appreciated the study showing the cost savings. Um, we oftentimes are asked, does the sports medicine and healthcare aspects that we provide to the athletes at the Olympic level penetrate down into the general public? I don't know if it does or not. It's a pretty slow process, but sometimes slow change is good change, just to make sure that you follow through and correct your steps in a proper manner. But nevertheless, it certainly is an interesting opportunity to look at what happens at the Olympic Games and in an elite sports medicine clinic and how that might have implications. I'd like to thank you for your courtesy in allowing me to present and share with you today. If you ever have any questions, let me know. I cannot get you tickets for Sochi. Thank you.